is APAC, Australia's public affairs channel. Well, welcome everyone. We might start. Um, I'm just going to uh, ask the panellists to speak uh, and then I'll take questions individually for the panellists because the, you know, they're both dealing with quite specific issues. Uh, I think this is going to be an exciting panel. It's really about, I guess, uh, the Australian's journey when it comes to social affairs. Um, so first I've got the pleasure of introducing Julie Rigg. Um, when the Australian began publication out of Canberra in 1964, Julie Rigg was one of the youngest journalists on staff. She worked successively for edit editors Max Newton, Adrian Diemer and Walter Comer. She covered education and immigration and also wrote a fortnightly column on social issues. In this paper she will tell some stories from those years and reflect on the editorial attitudes she encountered writing about the status of women, the Vietnam War, sex education and other issues of the time. I bet there are some stories to tell, Julie. Uh, Julie joined the Daily Telegraph as a cadet in 1960, joined the Australian in 1964 and wrote as a columnist until 1971. She joined the Radio Science Unit of the Australian Broadcasting Commission in 1972, helped found the Australian Women's Broadcasting Cooperative in 1974 and coordinated the resulting coming out show in 1975 and again in 1980. She now writes a monthly film blog for ABC Arts Online. And she just mentioned to me that uh, Sandra Hall and herself were both recipients of the Geraldine Pascal Prize. Uh, and that Geraldine Pascal was, of course, uh, as Julie described her, a flamboyant arts editor at The Australian. So we might hear a little more about that. Welcome, Julie. Thanks very much. Um, I do have a few pictures. They're probably not in the order I want, wanted, but it's amazing what you find in old files, and I thought some of you may, might enjoy them. Um, I've really been asked to talk about the Australians' interaction with and coverage of the second wave of feminism. I'm not a historian, so I hope you'll forgive that there are so many anecdotes. But I do think you can make some historical generalisations about what Murdoch's mission was then and what he achieved. And beyond the rhetoric we've heard the last two days about, you know, a national voice and so on, one was modernisation. This was an intergenerational challenge. The state and national politi politics were dominated by old men. Um, and if you doubt it, here's a quote from the editorial in The Australian on January the 2nd, 1965. I'm not sure the, whether Max wrote it, Max Newton wrote it, but it's credited to him as electoral comment. Unfortunately, both our political leaders are old men and have little sympathy with or expanding our national thinking to a more direct involvement in Asian affairs. It's too much to expect that they should. Each is plainly bored with difficult issues of trade policy, of defence policy, of immigration policy, which must necessarily come forward as the world of Asia and the South Seas increasingly grips our attention. The contrast between, you know, the, the attitudes of Menzies and Caldwell couldn't be starker. In this modernisation project, the Australian had a set of liberal humanist values. They were superintendent um, in the 70s or from about 67 on by uh, Douglas Brass who was the kind of elderly mentor in Sydney. But from the beginning, the Australian editorialised against censorship, against racial discrimination, for a fairer treatment of Aboriginal people. And, but if this, these were part of the modernisation agenda, the new set of values, and the new challenge to power from a young generation to an old one, where were women? At the time, women's workforce participation was around 34%, I think, at the beginning of the 60s. It dropped off sharply on marriage. Um, the, uh, 
statisticians talk about the nappy valley when you hit the post-childbearing years and look at women in the workforce. Equal pay, except for a few professions, and that included journalism, didn't exist. The workforce was extremely stratified. Women were predominantly channelled into low-paid jobs in industry or as low-graded clerks and typists, teachers perhaps, physiotherapists, kindergarten teachers, and in, this was and the clerk type of strata was inside and outside the public service. There was uh, no, we had to establish the right to work. When we started in Australia, in, in Canberra, women had to resign permanent jobs in the public service on marriage. When I wrote about this quite early on, protesting the injustice, I was startled to receive a phone call from Don Chip, then Liberal member for Higginbotham. Um, I think he was one among many who rang and said, is that Julie Rigg representing the feminine view? Um, but at least one politician was listening. How did the Australians see women as potential readers? To be frank, I really don't think Rupert and Max Newton thought very hard about this. There were women's pages. Um, Rupert knew that certain kinds of products brought in advertising. He was always keen on fashion um, right from the beginning and used to comment on when uh, fashion writers. Um, but at the same time, the Australian from the outset established the Martin Collins page, the back da page diary, a pseudonym from Martin Place and Collins Street in Melbourne. My memory of it was that it was under the tutelage of Sully Chandler, who was an excellent newspaper man, a former managing editor of the Daily Mail, along where Rupert had learnt some production values. The tone, the pics were of primarily dolly birds, and if you could smuggle in a woman, a lot of legs and occasionally uh, a bikini shot appeared. And the tone was clearly directed at other men, particularly young men, as in, oh, did you see the bird so-and-so was squiring? It was this kind of stuff, often written, you know, just to fill. Um, but Murdoch knew sex sold. He'd learnt that during the Sun Mirror tabloid wars. What did Rupert want? How did he see women as readers? Um, here is his first direction that I could find. Published in a set of daily bulletins he issued to staff in the first few months of 1965, from February to April. And that was the time that he and Max Newton parted ways. They'd had a falling out over protection because New um, Murdoch was played by Black Jack McEwen. I think he wanted influence, but McEwen played him, and for a brief and bewildering period, the Australian was supporting the country party and protection. The darling Peter Blasey came into the office one day with string tied around his trousers to, as bow yangs at the, <laughs> to, to indicate the new outlook. But here's Rupert, and these, these um, daily bulletins, you know, issued in detail, the sort of thing Mark Day was talking about earlier, um, display a considerable knowledge of craft. And he says, the women's page is almost is most readable and informative. It has a good balance between display and reading matter and seems to be aimed at exactly the right sort of woman we should be pitching for, namely the educated mother and housewife in her early to mid thirties. The women's page was abolished uh, in 1966 when uh, Adrian Deemer was appointed and it was reinstated briefly in 1971 after Adrian was fired, and that mantra reappeared again. Um, this is the this is the bulletin. Uh, it, it's really well worth reading this whole set of bulletins, um, published by um, Rick Thross, Mike Thrussell, one of the um, founding subs, and you get a real sense of. Murdochian attitudes as well, complaints here and there about bleeding hearts infiltrating the 
letters pages, academics writing long waffly articles and so on, but mainly he's teaching everybody their craft. Um, could we have a look at the slides of the staff at that time, the back bench? That's the, uh, sorry for the reproduction, I couldn't find the original. Um, this is the back bench at the start. Um, so that's Rupert in his shirt sleeves, um, all male, Mike Collingworth, my stepfather Bob Hope, a talented layout man, Walter Comer, Jules, Jules Zanetti, John Stevens, features editor, Rupert, with his back to camera, Solly Chandler, and right down in the corner, Bob Duffield, who was handling foreign pages from the start. Um, but there were women on the staff. There were four of us in editorial. Uh, Sandra Hall and Sue Jordan working with my mother on those women's pages and me. I was just 21. I was the only woman on the new staff. Um, in the beginning I worked, I was assigned two rounds. Uh, one was immigration. Uh, which didn't last very long because I broke a story about us, the department discreetly moving away from the white Australia policy to recruit migrants from Asia, mainly Turkey. And I'd been given this in my first off-the-record briefing and <laughs> clearly I couldn't go back. And the university. Um, and it was really a case of having your education in public, as, as Robert Hughes said. But the university, which was the Australian National University, wasn't even contemplated that I should get on the phone or fly around the country to talk to other universities um, and make contacts then. Oh, sorry, that's me, and that's the general chaos of a reporter's room pre-computerisation. Uh, um, um, so... I was pretty well left on my own resources, called out in the house by Jim Cairns once when I reported some indiscreet remarks he made about Ben Chifley to the ANU Labor Club. Um, and just once sent into state, um, in May 1965, there was a huge international congress in Melbourne on human relations and the theme was automation and technology and its impact on the workforce. J.K. Galbraith was the keynote speaker. Menzies opened it. Um, it. I was sent as an afterthought. I think I was bucketed on a plane in the afternoon and got there in time to check in and go to the day two of the conference where the social was discussed. It is ever thus. And um, at one stage, Joe Reardon, I think... Joe Reardon, a speaker from the Federated Clerks Union, was talking about uh, some of the changes that needed to be made in the workforce due to industrialisation. And this turned into an entire litany about why women should not be allowed to work shift work, um, which is where the penalties were, um, that it would be dangerous for them to be travelling at home home in the dark and they could be assaulted at bus stops. Um, and I'm sitting there writhing, thinking, you know, what patronising rubbish. And suddenly I heard a hissing around this huge hall. And, and it continued as Reardon continued. And that was a, a moment of real elation and epiphany for me because I realised that things that I was feeling, which is personally insulted and also outraged that women were going to be so restricted, um, were actually shared by many women delegates. Um, so I went back and reported that the conference was extremely bo boring I don't even remember what I wrote. I don't think I wrote about this, but it shaped an attitude. Um, Galbraith had reported the age left early in disgust. As an <laughs> attempt at looking at the future, it was a dog. If the, there was an organised feminist movement 
in Canberra in those days, I didn't come across it. Most student and academic politics were focused on opposition to conscription and then Vietnam. I attended teachings. I covered demonstrations. Um, I learnt about the history of Vietnam, its colonisation by the French, the Chinese beforehand, partition, war for unification and liberation. Both Bruce Petty and I marched in opposition to conscription. But there were flickerings on the ANU campus. Some time between 64 and 66, and I haven't been able to date this, um, I was tipped off, I think, by Paul Lynham about a planned demonstration by um, women students to occupy the public bar of the Civic Hotel in Canberra, from which they were restricted. Um, so I set off to cover it. Unfortunately, if we could find that picture, the photographer and I arrived early, and uh, I was the first one to be evicted. <laughs> <We might. laughs> so here's the argument. I don't know. That's, that's the barman bouncer. And I really don't know who this is. But I wonder if he was Asio. Mm. He looks like <laughs> an Asio. <laughs> Gabardine coat and all. There'd be some lovely picture research to be done then. Yeah. In 1966, as I said, the women's pages uh, were abolished. And I was asked... Um, to contribute a column to the op-ed pages that was opposite the, um, the leader page, the cartoon page and so on. Um, and I was given very little in the way of briefing about what I was to write about. The first issue was called, I think, the female view or the feminine view and I was pretty uncomfortable with this but you know, I think they'd vaguely asked me what, I, what to call it, and I said, I don't know, you know, so they'd, that's what they did. Um, this drew a fairly immediate protest. If we go to the last st stage, the letter, um, from... Uh, sorry, not the, the... Yes, from Lillian Foxcroft uh, in Strathaven Lodge, uh, Methodist home for the aged in Berrydale, Tasmania. And she wrote, There is no such thing as the feminine view, Julie Rigg. Is there the masculine view? Consider the administration of superannuation. In Western Australia, under the government super scheme, on the death of a contributor, if male and married, his widow is paid slightly more than half. But should the wife die first, the widower continues to receive the full amount. I can't work out how this is equitable. And then she goes into the cost of living arguments and comes back. I suggest investigation of this question to the younger women who are pressing for equal pay. Thank you for the Australian. It is grand to have a newspaper I can read at last. I hope you leave out the heading to Julie Riggs' column and, the f and please, Martin Collins, don't refer to young women as birds. It's silly and cheap, and it makes me so mad I'm in danger of having a heart attack. It's a <laughs> it was a marvellous letter, and there were a few like that. Um, so clearly we were, or I was actually, striking a chord. Let me tell you some of the things I was writing about. Uh, I I'm doing this because when I read Dennis Kryle's book, his treatment of women is sort of bundled into a chapter called Women, the Arts and Society. And that's fair enough in the sense that um, women did specialise in arts journalism, particularly, as we heard before lunch, from um, mid to late 60s on through the 70s. Um, what, was, what I was writing about, and I don't, don't think many pe women were writing about this at this time, seems to have escaped his attention. I don't know whether it's because the earliest uh, years of the Australian are uh, still under copyright um, and they're only on microfiche, or because I got Bruce to bring home 
four folders of columns from the Australian when I stopped writing for them from the cuttings library and somehow they never found their way back. Um, luckily I found some of them the other day. I was writing about sex. I wrote about sex education and I mentioned some of the myths that I'd encountered as a young journalist. For example, that one could insert Coca-Cola or an aspirin in the vagina as a spermicide. I wrote about my own extremely humiliating experience of wearing on my first date at 15 a condom I had found in my, the bathroom cupboard on my thumb. This is true. I thought it was a finger guard. <laughs> I nicked myself with my father's razor, shaving my legs, so I wrapped, ripped a bandage off an old sheet around and put this thing on it and off we went. It was the most excruciating experience. The movie, this was in the Woi Woi Picture Theatre, it was a double date and the movie that was playing was The Long Hot Summer and it was an extremely long movie. Um, that column caused me to be carpeted before it went in the paper and I was called into a solid wall of male editors, some of them, particularly John Stevens, I think, the, who this feature sub, father of six, um, Walter Comer and Adrian, to explain myself. I defended myself and I said that, you know, what I wrote about, including attitudes, was all true and supported the case, and somehow the story got through. I couldn't find it, but I didn't spend long in the files. Uh, but I know because I kind of kept meeting people at parties who, the following year or so, saying, did you do that? I wrote about sexual harassment. I wrote about the harassment on a, experienced on a train, about stubbing a cigarette out on the toe of a commuter sitting behind me on the train to Gosford when I was about 17 or 18, and he kept sticking his toed foot between the gap of the seat and rummaging around in my bum. So I ground a cigarette, they were smoking in those days, um, in trains out on his toe and the hole in the sock and I watched him limp down the platform at Woi Woi. Um, I wrote about abortion and in a 1967 column which earned me a whole page of denunciation in the Victorian Police Journal mentioned in one paragraph the unfortunate habit police had of loitering in public la lavatories on occasions or of firing first and asking questions afterwards. It was really a column about a uh, community's attitudes to trust and trust between community and the professions. Um, and uh, police were certainly having some difficulties. Um, this this got me quoted enormous length and the writer concluded that I belonged to the oldest profession of all. Um, but it was publicity, I suppose, of a, a sort. It was headed, you know, who is Julie Rigg? Mine wasn't specifically a column about women's views. I insisted on that. I was also writing about censorship, particularly of film, about the immorality of conscription, about children being napalmed in Vietnam, about racism, about Aboriginal affairs and the referendum. One particular column, one of the last I wrote, was about the century of fear that lay behind the white Australia policy. It was about the metaphors that dominated popular discourse on race and immigration, and reading it again today I could almost weep. Just change the language slightly and you have current debate. Um, the, the terms then was that opening uh, our doors to Asian immigration would open the floodgates and it would um, weaken our moral fibre um, and they are particularly visual metaphors. One of the earliest columns I wrote, they were sometimes satirical, was based on an a press conference given by the then Defence Minister Alan Fairhall in the Menzies government, who'd come back from Vietnam believing that the policies of encircling and starving Vietnamese were working because he had been shown two very thin Viet Cong.
I suggested this might be a whole new way of assessing social policy and its impact. Um, could you alleviate, could you assess the effectiveness of welfare programs by saying you, two very fat men had been cited in Redfern, etc., etc.? It was a terrifically wide brief. I had, apart from the blue penciled tear sheets that would come back from Doug Brass occasionally, I had very little um, either guidance or reining in. And my point was that intelligent women were interested in the whole lot. Um, so much so that when I published in 1968 a, an edited collection of articles, essays about the situation of Australian women to which Sandra was a contributor, I suddenly had a deputation from a group calling itself Women's Liberation. Sorry, 1969 the book actually came out, did it in 68. They were particularly upset that I had asked Ian Turner to write the chapter on women in Australian history and that I had ignored work by uh, such women as Anne Curthoys, um, who were the first feminist historians in a sense. Um, well, I suddenly... I had. I simply didn't know about them and I just put the book together while doing other things on my contacts. Adrian Deemer, it's true, as Dennis Kryle says, gave enormous encouragement to women. He employed them, uh, Jane Pearl Lairs, Lindor Crisp, uh, Janet Hawley. Um, he was supportive. One young woman he employed six months before his departure was um, Daniela Humphreys, now Danny Torsh, um, who was employed as an education writer. She'd come straight from a job as an organiser for the Students' Union, the National Education Organiser. She was um, writing news stories about education. It was an important issue then and now. And Adrian assigned her a column after Henry Schoenheimer took over. She wrote about the need for childcare. One of the early demands of women, women's liberation was childcare, about the efforts of the kindergarten union to reach out to poor children. Um, she wrote about the need for sex education in schools. And she didn't last long. When uh, Dema left, after in the churn of editors that followed, Bruce Rothwell arrived, and he um, summoned that Danny to his office um, and accused her of being a Labor supporter. She said she was, but challenged him to find that in her copy, which she said was objective. Uh, he didn't respond. She was fairly rapidly marginalised. The her column was consigned back then to the reinstated women's page, and uh, a journalist called Judy Bavell was brought across from the mirror to edit those. Look, you can only push women so far. We were very well aware of how stratified we were in uh, in newspapers with rare exceptions, such as Betty Riddell and so on. Um, women didn't get a crack at big economic or political stories. Um, they tended to be shoved or corralled or have a great time, in many cases, into covering the arts, to write about education, which, as long as it had to do with children, was was okay. Um, so on, in the offices of the Australian um, in 1970 Danny brought together a group of women who performed a group called the Media Women's Action Group. The initial target was to desegregate the Sydney Journalists Club which refused to let women drink in other, way, uh, in other than a, a little ladies lounge and the initial members were Daniela Humphreys as she was then Elizabeth Weinhausen and Sandra Simons. This whole, this little action group got a kick along from Jermaine Greer on her first book tour for the female unit, who refused to speak at the club. And soon we were holding very big meetings in uh, a hall in King's Cross. We formed different groups. 
one of uh, one of those groups was about childcare. Um, some